morning, everybody. Um, as Chad said, I'm Kim Chetso. I'm finishing up my master's in communication right now. So this is my first and only year as a fellow, and I'm really happy to be here. And I want to talk to you today about my little sister. We don't have a traditional relationship that you might think of when you think of siblings. Um, over the past few years, our relationship has been full of challenges, some really severe, some minor. Uh, and most of those challenges have been about boundaries. And for me, as her big sister and her role model, it's been a question of how do I navigate within these boundaries, both those that are self-imposed and those that are constructed for us. Um, so um, my little sister, I asked her what she wanted her pseudonym to be for this speech, and she chose Ariel. So <laughs> it's nice to know that The Little Mermaid is still a relevant movie for kids these days. <laughs> Uh, we met through the Big Brother Big Sister program 10 years ago, so we're not biologically related siblings, um, but we do call each other sister in unit. Uh, we originally met when my older sister, my bi biologically related sister, joined the program as a mentor. So for those who aren't familiar, Big Brother Big Sister's basic mission is to help kids achieve their potential. And the main way they do that is through mentoring programs. So they pair at-risk kids with adults who can volunteer a couple hours a month doing a productive activity together. So you can have dinner together, work on homework, go see a movie, just spend quality time a couple hours a month. Uh, so it's a really fun, low commitment program um, that my sister joined and it looked really fun. But then she received a job offer in Chicago that she really wanted to take. So she asked if I would step up and become the full-time mentor or big as we call it in the program to Ariel. And I had met Ariel already through my sister's relationship, and we got along well enough. At this point, she was six, and it was honestly just really fun hanging out with her. You get to play with a kid again and you know, go to the park and go to amusement parks, and a lot of local businesses will donate services for free. So you can go bowling and do all kinds of things at no cost. So it just sounded really fun for me and, and taking a break from my professional work a couple hours a month to do this. Um, but the main reason I said yes to this opportunity was because I knew if I said no, Ariel would just get put back in the system. When I met her at age six, I was the third stranger she had been paired with in just a couple years. And some kids can handle that cycle, but for some littles who I've met in the program, that slight rejection really impacts their confidence, their self-esteem, and their ability to relate to others in the future. So when I met Ariel, she was really shy. It took a lot of time and effort to pull her out of her shell and get her to trust me. And I didn't want to make her go through that all over again with someone else. So I said yes. Um, so now 10 years later, we're still together. And when I asked her while preparing the speech what she thinks our biggest challenges have been, uh, she immediately said boys in school, because she's <laughs> 16. And, and that's what her life revolves around. Um, I hadn't even thought of those things. While they have been huge <laughs> challenges, to me, our biggest challenges have always been our differences. Uh, we're just inherently different in almost every way. Uh, some examples, um, she's biracial, she's half Hispanic. I come from a Caucasian background and school district and neighborhood. She's low income, whereas my family is middle to upper class. Um, she has three younger siblings. I have one older sister. Uh, she lives in a single parent household. I, my parents have been married for 34 years. And although we live in the same town, just a couple minutes apart, we live on very divided sides. Um, so to me, these logistical and demographic differences have always been a struggle point. But thankfully, my career has helped me handle these. Uh, my background is in nonprofit services and providing basic needs resources. So part of my job is knowing where people can get help when they need it in the community for free. So whenever her family had a problem with how to pay the rent, where to get a winter coat, or, or how to keep food on the table, I could fix that. I could solve that problem in a day, and it felt awesome. But then about five years ago, a new problem came up, and I was completely blindsided and had no idea how to fix it. Ariel's mom called me one night, crying, really upset, saying something terrible had happened. Um, Ariel had been sexually assaulted by a neighbor. So this was an older man who was trusted to babysit her and her siblings and some neighborhood kids from time to time. 
and he had abused this power of authority he had, betrayed trust in the neighborhood, and um, we were left with, with some pieces to try to put back together. So when she called, I just froze. My mind went completely blank. I had no response for her. She was asking for help, and I didn't really say anything. I was just paralyzed. Uh, this was a moment, for some reason, I was always afraid would happen. I don't know if it's because I'm a woman, or, but sexual assault is always just like this looming fear I feel in my life, and, and I was just always afraid this tragedy would happen to someone I really cared about. And now it finally did, but I was still so unprepared. So I didn't really say anything. I didn't offer her any comfort. I didn't offer any next steps. I just kind of hung up and said, I'll call you later. I can't think about this right now. And to this day, I still really regret that reaction. But thankfully, I got over it. I woke up, did some research, hooked up her family with some free therapy and legal services, and we got some justice and tried to move on from this tragedy. Um, but over time, we could tell that we hadn't really fixed anything. Um, the consequences of a tragedy like that were lingering in Ariel. And, um, she just had all this pent up rage and frustration and, and confusion that she hadn't processed yet. And, and none of us in her life really knew how to help her process it herself. So eventually I got another call from her mom, very upset again, crying again, saying that um, fighting with Ariel was just constant and it was getting too much. She couldn't take it. At this point, they had moved in with Ariel's aunt. So 10 people were living in a one bedroom house. Uh, all the kids were sleeping in the garage, and this was winter, so it was just a bad situation all around. Close quarters, so anybody in that situation would fight, but when you had all this, this pent-up emotional residue, it just was like a fuel to the fire. So her mom was calling and, and saying, I just can't take it anymore, and I'm afraid if we keep fighting, Ariel's going to walk out the door and, and not come back, or something terrible is going to happen to her while she's gone one day. So she asked if, if I could step in and have Ariel live with me, and if I could take over some parental responsibilities. So I, I felt paralyzed again in this moment, uh, but for a different reason. Uh, I wasn't completely shocked by this. I had secretly been dreaming of the opportunity to adopt Ariel for many years. At this point, we had been together maybe six years. I knew her really well. Um, I was in my early 20s, and, and I was set up to do this kind of thing. I had a house, a solid income, a partner to help me. I felt really capable to be her parent in ways that her parent couldn't, and for no fault of her own. Her, her mom has always done the best that she can, but um, I just had some additional resources that I, I felt I could give and help Ariel chart this path to success. But thankfully, I, I did pause, take a minute to think about it, didn't just have a knee-jerk reaction, um, and took some time to think about this huge decision I had to make. And my thought process eventually went back to boundaries and the idea of if it's ever appropriate to cross certain lines. And I thought about family and motherhood and how I ultimately came to the conclusion that that's a boundary I can't cross in Ariel's life. Uh, my role is to be her big sister, her friend, her mentor, not her mother. And that's a very different role that, while I wanted to fill, it just wasn't my place. And um, that's not really the kind of support her family needed. While I was capable of doing it, if I took Ariel out of her home, I would actually be undermining her and her family's ability to achieve success on their own terms and to be capable for themselves um, and, and that just kind of goes against the whole mission of Big Brother, Big Sister and, and you know, my personal values. So a few weeks ago when, when preparing this, um, I told Ariel, I confessed to her my longtime desire to have control over her life. Um, and she just rolled her eyes and said, duh, you know, it was, it's been obvious for 10 years that, <laughs> that I want to be this, this person in her life. Um, and she's not offended by it or anything. You know, I'm sure it makes her feel loved and, and cared for. Um, but then she said something really, really important that she's never said to me before that, that I'm really glad I asked her about this so I could hear this. She said that no one has control over her life, not even her mom. So even if I had filled that role, 
I couldn't control who she hangs out with outside of school or when she does her homework or what she eats every day. Um, no one has that power over her. But she said, what I do have that no one else has, including her mom, is influence, the power to influence her choices. Um, and that has meant so much to me to hear that because that means everything I've been doing for 10 years has made a difference. She's noticed. Um, and, and that was really great to hear. And a good example of that is this tradition Ariel and I have. Every school year we make to-do lists. Uh, so it's certain academic and social goals she has till the end of the year to achieve. And in return, I'll reward her with a really special opportunity that we can do together. So an example is in middle school, uh, the agreement was if she finished middle school with all good grades, um, I would let her fly her own airplane. And I made this happen. We did it. And she was the coolest kid in school for a long time. Um, so fast forward a couple years, she's a sophomore in high school now. Um, the stakes are higher for kids in high school these days. Our to-do list is really long as we prepare for college applications. Um, but our, she's right on track to complete all of her goals. She was just named president of the Gay Straight Alliance in her high school. Um, so she's doing really well. And um, her reward when she graduates high school will be a trip anywhere she wants in the world. With one stipulation, she has to bring her big sister along. Thanks. Um, so what Katie's referring to is I'm moving to Nashville, Tennessee, post-graduation in May. Um, and I told Ariel this this summer. I let her know it was coming. Um, so when I asked her about our, our biggest challenges after boys in school, the third thing she said was the distance, that this upcoming move, which she's, she's very unhappy about. Um, and it, it was really hard for me to decide to do this, but part of saying no to being her mother was giving me the opportunity to do some things for my own life. And um, there's just some really great opportunities down south that now is the time to pursue those. Um, so it's, it's not a decision I've made lightly, but thankfully my older sister, so the, the one who introduced me into this program in the beginning, lives in Detroit. She's still somewhat local. And we're, we're kind of reversing roles 10 years later. I've asked her now if she can fill in for my place and at least be the physical mentor. Um, I've committed to flying back home every six weeks to see her. Um, but I always knew this would come, you know. Um, I just never thought I would stay here forever. And I hope she doesn't stay here forever. I hope she, you know, gets out of town and sees new places. So we were bound to have some distance, but I think we've built up enough of a relationship where we can, we can bridge this distance gap well enough. How uh, unique or common would you say your experience uh, through the Big Brother Three Sisters program has been? Because it seems like you were not only you know with the the mentor, but also somewhat integrated with the family. Um, how does that is that common, or is that more unique to your situation? Yeah, I think it's pretty unique. Um, so a, a lot of kids do get paired with so many mentors by the time they're eighteen. And a lot of that is because um, a lot of people sign up to be a mentor through this program when they're in college as a resume booster. Especially in Kalamazoo where I live, um, the College of Education is huge at Western Michigan University. And so a lot of like, um, you know, education majors do this with really good intentions, but then they graduate and quit or they move away or start a family of their own and just drop out. Um, so, so the fact that I've been with her for 10 years is pretty rare. But the more I talk about it and the more I meet people in the program, um, there are some other cases. So there's um, a couple people I know who have been matched for decades. And the mentor has been a part of the mentee's wedding ceremony and college graduation. And now they, they babysit their kids. You know, they're like the grandparent in the life almost. So it does happen, but it's, it's pretty rare. Um, but I'm always talking to my liaison at Big Brother Big Sister about how do we create like this network where 
matches feel support to, to stay in this space. Because it's, it's a hard thing to do if you're really committed to it. Um, so something I do that helps is, in my little sister's family, all of her siblings are in this program. So they all have different bigs. And the minute I know of a new big for this family, I reach out to them, we get together, we form like a little family network um, so we can all stay on the same page about where, where the family is right now, what they need, how we can help. Um, we meet for coffee like once a month and just like touch bases. Um, and things like that really help keep the relationship going, but it is pretty rare, I think. It, it didn't cause any distance, and, and part of that is because I'm not sure how much she knows about that phone call, um, which is why doing this speech and telling her about it felt really strange at first, because I don't really know what she knows, um, and we don't really talk about that situation too much, because I imagine she could feel so many things about it. Um, but ultimately, it was, it was a question of, how do we, as her entire support system, make her life better? So it was really a great situation. She shouldn't have bad feelings about it, but I don't really know. Um, but a lot of, there was some space between us then, just for natural reasons. At that point, she was 14, and she was 14. You know, she, <laughs> There was distance between her and any adult in her life. Um, so she just needed space in general. And, and when she was living in a house with 10 other people, she couldn't find that anywhere. Um, so we would do like little mini vacations, we'd call it. She would come to my house for a weekend, and then I would go somewhere else for the day. I would give her, you know, hours alone at my house just to be alone because that's a luxury a lot of people don't have. Um, so I've, I've tried to bridge that distance, and, and it's not really an issue anymore. Yeah, <laughs> um, there's been frustrations every day, but thankfully, I don't know if, if it's because Ariel's just so awesome or if we just click, um, but there's never been a time where I've felt that she's unresponsive to me. And I do know some bigs who have quit for that very reason. They just don't feel like they're getting through to the, the little and um, they're just saying like empty words. And that I've never felt that with her. She, she always makes it clear that she wants to spend time with me. Um, we just have a lot of natural things in common, too. We, we like the same books. We like to do the same activities. So it's, e it's easy to be together. The biggest frustration has been with sort of the, the boundaries I was talking about, the more systemic boundaries and um, with her family and with caseworkers and the Department of Human Services and the school. and. All these, all these outside things in her life that they're hard for me to penetrate. So I do have some guardian capabilities when it comes to her, but like I can't call the school and you know I can't like pick her up from school. I have to get a note and little stupid things like that just really like get in the way and make it frustrating to be there for her. So the problem we're dealing with now is she needs a, um, a physical to do school sports, um, but her mom just, um, can't make it happen right now for, for a lot of reasons. Um, but I can't do anything about it. I can't even call and make the appointment. Um, so it's just really frustrating. Like I'm trying to help and be there, and I can't. Um, but in 10 years, there's never been a day, honestly, where I haven't wanted to do this. Um, and that's why I encourage anyone to be a mentor. It's, it's just so obvious the good it does. Um, you know, Every report card she brings home, I don't want to say it's all because of me, but um, <laughs> you know, I look at her and then I look at her peers who aren't in the program or don't have a support network and there's a huge difference, there's a huge gap. And, and all you have to give is a few hours a month. Um, I give way more than that, obviously, but um, that's all that it takes. And so it's never been a question of should I do this, it's how can I do this more? 
maybe you covered this at the beginning. I came in late, and I apologize. But where did this come from in you in the first place? It came from my big sister. So I, I only have one sibling, and we're two years apart, so we're very close. Um, she actually tells people we're twins because um, it just feels like we are all the time. So, And Ariel, my little sister, she's the oldest sibling in her family. So she has siblings to connect with, but not in the way I do. Having an older sister is so different than having a younger sister. She feels responsible in her household. Um, she takes on a lot of duties for her younger siblings that you know, I've never had to as a little sister. I get to just look up to my big sister and, and learn from her. Um, and it's so cool to be able to offer that opportunity to someone else. And it's something we all do together. So I don't know if you had missed me saying that. My big sister started in the program and pulled me into it. So the three of us are in this together. Um, and we have like our own family unit. Um, we're spending Thanksgiving together. So um, yeah, it's just nice to be able to give someone the chance for a relationship that I've enjoyed so much. Is that it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Joffrey, and I'm a senior here at Grand Valley, an uh, undergraduate student majoring in English. And in the future, I'd like to be a high school teacher. So hopefully, graduating in April, uh, that's where I'll be. Um, Kim spoke very powerfully about challenges to leadership in a social sphere. And I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about challenges to leadership uh, in an in institution. Uh, but before I begin, um, I want to talk a little bit about what leadership means to me. Um, ever since I first uh, joined the Howenstein Center, I, uh, I've been struggling with this idea of what exactly is a leader. Um, and when I began, my definition of leadership was somebody who leads other people, which is functional but not very pretty. Um, and I think what I find problematic about this definition is that it emphasizes too strongly the relationship between a leader and his or her uh, followers, so to speak. And I think that's very important, but to me it's just begging the question. What I really want to know is, what is it about that particular person that puts them in a position where people actually want to follow them? And uh, so what I have for you today is the most updated, tentative, uh, uh, Kevin's definition of what a leader is. Um, and to me, I think a leader is a person who has the freedom, the resources, and the faith to enact a vision. Um, and to me, the cornerstone of this definition is that idea of vision. I think all the best leaders that I know have something in their head that they just can't shake. So perhaps it's a preoccupation with a really important question. Maybe it's just a genuine desire to help other people. Or perhaps it's a lingering unease with the way things are or the way things are headed. Um, but at the same time, I don't believe that uh, this idea of vision is the end all or be all of leadership. Uh, I think plenty of people have that kind of cognitive itch, uh, but they're not actually leaders. And so to me, uh, what I think uh, the difference between these people who have this cognitive itch and leaders are that leaders are given the opportunity to take that vision from out of their head and unfold it in the world around them. And in particular, they're able to do this through a, combina a combination of freedom, of resources, and of faith. So perhaps they are trying to implement their vision in a culture that is friendly to them, that actually wants to hear what they have to say. Perhaps they have the funds or the social networks or the friendships to be able to, um, to begin implementing this vision. And most importantly, that they have some sense of faith in themselves, even when they're faltering, to keep going, and that others around them have some faith in, in their ideas. Um, and I think that this is uh, important for any leader. So I think it's important for established leaders as well as for up and coming leaders. Uh, but for up-and-coming leaders, there's a slight imbalance in these four qualities. Um, quite frankly, right now, we don't have a lot to our name, right? Uh, we've maybe done some things, but uh, we're, we're still fairly young. And so in this way, I feel like uh, what we perhaps lack the most right now, or what we need the most, um, is a sense of faith, a sense of faith in us and our abilities. If we're sitting here today, it's because someone looked at us 
and saw something that at the time we hadn't fully implemented yet, that they saw some sort of value uh, intrinsically in you. And uh, so I feel that, uh, uh, that they have to, I think if they don't have this, it's very difficult for them to begin that process of unfolding their vision in the world. Um, so uh, I think uh, in this way, faith is, is somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy, that if people have faith in you, you are much more likely to be able to uh, accomplish tremendous things. And I think there are a couple of in uh, instances in my own education where I feel like uh, people or institutions have had great faith in me, even at, when at the time I was, uh, I was not in a position to be uh, accepting of that. So when I was in uh, high school, I was part of the International Baccalaureate Program, or IB program, which is very similar to AP um, in the sense that it's college preparatory, um, although it has more of sort of a, a global perspective. You do a lot of sort of talking about uh, different perspectives on the same event. And one of my teachers, Ms. Neff, uh, in my 20th century world topics class, uh, was a strong believer in the Socratic method. And so she would bring up some sort of controversial, controversial historical event um, and ask us a series of questions about it. Um, and we would answer, and then she would ask another question, and Stephen Kaplinsky in the back would say something that I thought was wrong. And so I would tell him that I thought he was wrong. And then somebody would jump on his side and say that I was wrong. Somebody would jump on my side and say that I was correct after all. And before we knew it, Ms. Neff would sit, was sitting back and we were all engaging in really lively intellectual debates with each other, um, just as, uh, as high schoolers. And so my belief in this, uh, or, and so what I found really important about that is that Ms. Neff then had, had some sort of deep faith in us, even as children, to be able to actually talk about things and, and come to conclusions and, and value those conclusions that we came to. Excuse me. Um, so as a sophomore, now in college, uh, my sort of belief in uh, the value of sort of having faith in people to come to their own conclusions uh, really hit a strong point when I joined uh, the Writing Center at Grand Valley. And at the Writing Center, we believe very strongly in non-directive tutoring, uh, which says rather than take someone's paper and say, well, you need to change this, this, and this, what you do is you ask them a series of questions that are designed to help them articulate what their concerns are with the paper and then work together to find some ways to solve that. Um, and so I, uh, I really, in combination uh, with sort of the Socratic method and this non-directive method, um, I really became a firm believer that this is uh, a very valuable technique. And perhaps the best example that I ever saw of this in a college setting was in my community working classics class with Professor uh, Michael DeWild. And so in this class, the way it worked is um, there was a small group of us. There was actually somehow impossibly just eight of us in the class. And what we were to do is we went into the community and taught a class on the humanities on the topic of our choice. Um, and so it was sort of a, a large responsibility to place on uh, the shoulders of undergraduate students. Um, but I remember on the first day, uh, all eight of us were seated there. And he walked in, and he sat down at the, the front of the room. And he folded his hands behind his head. And he said, what are your questions? And I knew instantly with just that one question, what the tone of this class was going to be. It was going to be a class where he cared a great deal about what we had to say, and that he believed that we should engage in authentic dialogue with each other to come uh, to conclusions, or perhaps to never really come to a conclusion at all. Um, and in that way, uh, I feel that it was, it was very successful, and um, it was something that I really strongly valued. Um, now, I said earlier that faith is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think it's true, but I think it also can cut in the other direction, that I think that even the strongest leaders, when there is a sense of a lack of faith in them, can find themselves faltering. And currently in my program, um, I have encountered a, a, an entirely different uh, environment than perhaps the one that Professor DeWild um, established in Community Working Classics. Um, when I joined my program, I met with some unexpected hurdles. Um, you have to understand, um, my program received a lot of oversight, not just from Grand Valley, but from the state itself. And so as a result, um, it's very important that my program can show that students are growing at a steady rate with every year that they're in this program. And um, as a result, in order to accomplish this, uh, the classes that I'm in are highly structured. So uh, we all take the same classes. We all do the same assignments. Um, and a lot of times in classes, we're not really engaging with each other. 
except to accomplish particular assessments um, that have sort of easily digestible uh, purposes, you know, that are sort of immediately relevant uh, to our future careers. Um, and to me, there was something missing in this and something that I think was most beautifully enacted in Professor DeWild's Community Working Classics class. And so um, you have to understand that coming into this program from uh, Professor DeWild's class, I had a lot of questions, a, a lot of sort of big questions. I wanted to know uh, what is the purpose of education? I wanted to know uh, what are the biggest problems that education faces today? How do you articulate the value of the humanities in the face of sort of adolescent scrutiny? Um, and the biggest question of all, what do you do when you write on a whiteboard with a non-whiteboard marker? <laughs> um, and it, in my classes, um, I found that you know, even when I offered up those questions, which I thought were very important, um, oftentimes I'd be told something like, uh, those are great questions, but we're actually working on this assignment right now, and so I need you all to finish that. Um, and so the more that I went without having those questions answered, the more, uh, the more convinced I became that those were actually the most important questions that we needed to be talking about. And so I did what any good student would do when his or her questions were not being answered. I misbehaved. I, uh, I argued with my professor in class. I whispered with other students while the professor was talking. I doodled in a notebook or stared off into space or frantically searched the internet for answers to my questions. Um, and uh, in other words, what I, what I did is I actually behaved as a petulant child and not as some sort of leader. I, I wanted my uh, professors to have faith in myself and my classmates to come to some sort of deep conclusions, but I wasn't demonstrating the qualities that were necessary for them to actually have that faith in me in the first place. So my conflict with this program came to a head um, when it implemented a, a sort of wildly unpopular and expensive requirement for students uh, that um, without uh, very much notice for any of us students and with, uh, and unfortunately, without consulting students about sort of how they felt about it or what their thoughts were. Um, and so I decided that, um, you know, enough was enough and so I was going to write a petition uh, to try and see if I could get some greater transparency about the decision making from this program to implement this particular requirement. Um, so I decided to, so I drafted a, a petition and decided to enact my plan um, at something called the Green Apple Award, which was uh, sort of an award which, with the best intentions, um, was essentially had the, the effect of saying, um, here is a, a, uh, an award to tell you that you've begun your program, um, but that you are still green and unripe, and that you should look at this award in the future uh, to remind you of how far you've come which of course is sort of a backhanded way of saying that we haven't come very far at all right now. Um, <laughs> and so uh, what I did is I passed, I passed around this uh, petition and it was quickly confiscated as contraband. Um, and when I, <laughs> when I spoke to the administrator who confiscated it, um, she said, uh, well, what did she say? Um, she said um, that, uh, you know, that um, I had to remember that I just received this Green Apple Award and that over the next 10 years I'd gradually get to a point where I could come to understand the complexities that underlie running some sort of program like this, but I wasn't there yet. Um, and when I pressed her I said, no, no, I, I think you're wrong. I think this is a great opportunity for students to sort of see the administrative concerns that trickle down into our own lives, that, which is applicable immediately to us as students and long term in our careers. Um, she said. Kevin, I've been doing this for 30 years. I think I know a bit more about this than you do. And what struck me most when she said that was, was not that it was rude necessarily. It's that technically she was right, you know. So I'm only 22. Uh, you know, she's been doing this for a really long time. Uh, that perhaps there was something to what she was saying. Perhaps I needed to sort of step back and take a back seat. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that what she'd actually vocalized was my concern, just framed a little bit differently, that still what she had told me is that effectively I was just a student, that you know, students can't do very much. And I think when you look around this room today, you know how, how that simply is not true, right? That 
students, when they're given the proper support and have a lot of faith in them, are, uh, can do, you know, accomplish tremendous things. And so uh, what I decided to do ultimately was go speak to uh, some other administrators about the possibility of starting a student advisory committee for my program. Because what I believed was that perhaps what all of this sort of was coming down to was a breakdown in communication between students and those who were running this particular program. And, uh, and I was really happy to say that I barely had the words student advisory program cross my lips. Then all of the administrators were saying, yes, yes, please. That sounds like a great idea. You know, we've tried that before. Let's, let's actually implement it, which was really happy to hear. And when I sent out emails uh, to other students trying to look for support, I had sort of an outpouring of support either from people who wanted to be on it or who thought it was a great idea, um, which feels very good. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I think what I'm hoping to do, and so we're actually beginning this program next semester, and so what I'm hoping to do with this is sort of explicitly use this program to resolve any sort of issues that we may still have um, in, in this program. But implicitly, I hope what it does is restore a sense of faith in students as uh, as, as bearers of knowledge and of opinions that, that actually matter and that are well thought out. Um, and as I wrap this up here, I, I just want to say that um, I feel like in this way, the Howenstein Center is a, a really valuable uh, space for all of us. That I feel like um, what it really is is an oasis or an alcove of sorts into which we can retreat from time to time uh, to think about um, you know, to think about our own vision, the vision that we want to enact, or maybe a vision that we haven't yet articulated to ourselves or to others, but is still somewhere in there in the back of your head. Um, and that it provides you with the freedom, the, the friendly environment, to talk about such a vision, and the resources, the community, and, uh, and, and Gleaves, and, and everyone who runs this to implement it. And most of all, a uh, deep sense and faith of us that uh, when students are able to uh, sort of be given opportunities that uh, they really can do tremendous things. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Um, the reason that I refer to that as a cognitive itch is because it's something that I feel very strongly, that I'm perpetually itchy. Um, and uh, I feel in this way that, you know, so I said earlier that there's a variety of ways that um, people uh, have their vision. So maybe it's because they um, want to answer a big question or they just don't like the way things are. And mine falls into the latter category for this. Um, that I think that the student advisory committee is a response to a situation that I was uncomfortable with, um, but ultimately I don't think it's my, I don't think it's my big vision. I am, um, I'm still actually working to articulate my big vision. Uh, so if anyone wants to help me with that, <laughs> I'd be more than happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, but I, I know it has something to do with, um, with uh, being a teacher, and it has something to do with um, the value of. of studying English or um, the value of literature. Um, and of course, I'd really like to talk, so obviously communication is going to be in there someplace. But. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Kevin, I have a question about the process. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I've noticed that the first two presentations um, were you know, you have some notes, but you so internalized this that you were able to articulate it with, with a great deal of, of verb, force, uh, interesting turns of phrase. Where did that come from? That's a good question. Um, so I don't really believe in memorizing speeches um, in general. Um, 
I, um, but what I do think is that the process of writing something out allows you to tap into something that uh, you, you feel inside. And so um, I suppose uh, the reason that I almost never looked at this is because I'd finally managed to articulate it in a particular way on paper that resonated with the way that I wanted to tell it to people. And so um, I think that, uh, I guess in terms of where it sort of came from inside of me is, I guess sort of a lot of thought about it, um, I, or I, I thought about it a great deal. I've um, sort of talked with other people about it and gotten their perspectives. And over time, I suppose, this, this business of having it running through your head while you're riding the bus or eating dinner um, manages to uh, find its way out your mouth and into the world. So. <laughs> did, I, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. I have a follow-up. Yeah. This morning when you got up, mm -hmm. did you wonder whether you would basically read from that, or did you feel that you had the confidence when you got up this morning to just tell it? Oh, no, there, there's a reason this is up here. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I fully plan to, uh, to stare at all of your faces and then do this. And, 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 and uh, I think maybe perhaps it's just because you're all so welcoming and uh, so friendly. And I feel very, feel very comfortable with you that I felt as if I could just talk authentically. When did you make that decision? Uh, when uh, Chad said, Kevin. <laughs> that's, that's what I made my decision. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, part of it uh, is that I am very convinced that I'm right. Um, so, um, so I suppose, I suppose but, but you have to understand that's not something that I have always had, or, or even that I've always had in not just this concept, but in myself in general. And so I think that that's partly why I, I believe very strongly in the Houndstein Center as a positive entity, is because it gives you this opportunity where it's really just institutional faith in a non a religious sense, right? But it's, a, it's an organization that's designed to help you be the best person that you can be. Um, and so in that way, I feel like um, I would have had a very, very hard time trying to keep going if I didn't know that I had sort of people who believed in me, both sort of personal friends or relationships, but also um, sort of an organization that, that believed in me. Um, in terms of your first question, um, I think that I think that um, the way I see it is that it sort of works from vision. So you have to have some sort of vision. Um, and then uh, what you need next is faith, right? So you need to have faith in yourself, and you need to have others have faith in you. For, um, and through that, then usually you can find sort of the freedom and the resources to enact what you want. But if people don't have faith in you, they won't follow you. And if you don't have faith in yourself, then you uh, will never act. And so in that way, I think faith is very, very important um, although I do think that um, what's worse than not having faith is having no vision while people have lots of faith in you. <laughs> um, I think that's a little bit of a scary situation to be in. So. Thanks. Scott. Well, so I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. A theme that I noticed when you throughout your presentation was the presence of a space for um, you know, kind of an oasis of, of introspection. You know, high school is this mess, use yeah. of the Socratic method. And then in college, it's been a combination of the Cook Leadership Academy of um, Professor DeWild's Community Working Class Express. What kind of lessons do you think you could draw from that theme for the Student Advisory Committee, giving hmm. students perhaps a chance to not just attend the meetings with faculty and right. be kind of scared down, but have a chance to kind of build each other up in, I guess, perhaps meetings like this one? Yeah, I think that's um, a really important question. Um, I think food helps. Um, on, a, on a surface level note. Um, I think what you really need is you need um, someone who is willing to, uh, to facilitate conversation. So what you really need is somebody who is uh, willing to not put forward perhaps their own view. So in this way, Ms. Neff 
she, she was a political science teacher essentially, um, and we have no idea how she voted, right? And so she was very, very careful to keep herself out of this, but instead always asking questions, always wanting to hear um, from us. And I think that that uh, position of having uh, someone who is willing to be the listener in the situation uh, tends to draw out conversation uh, when normally when you sort of walk in and um, express your own opinion, sometimes uh, that conversation can't come through. Any other questions for me or anything I can clear up? That's okay. But um, she told you that you were inexperienced and sure. you didn't know. How did you, I guess, mature and grow and take that kind of like, I think you're just going to let me know that I don't know. Um, yeah, first of all, I better clarify something. I was a problem child in college, not in high school. <laughs> so, as, a, as a high schooler, I was a very mild mannered kid, and I was mild mannered up until about this year. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, think, uh, I think what it had to be was. Um, I think, first of all, I think, uh, okay, so I think that uh, I n do not follow my lead here in any way, shape, or form. I think that what I did was my misbehavior, in a sense, was a way of sort of getting attention, right? That in some ways, I think that if I was perfectly pleasant, right, and just really willing to be accommodating, that perhaps nothing would ever have happened, right? And so I think that to some extent, you do need to have sort of a sense of spine, right? You need to be a little bit pokey. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, that you always need to be uh, willing to understand that you are coming to it with a particular perspective and you really can't possibly know what other people around you are thinking or what their concerns are. And so and that way I think my ego sort of got put aside um, after I threw my, um, my sort of college level tantrum. Um, I think that I sort of came to a sort of a deeper understanding of what actually needed to be done, um, in part through um, consulting, I guess, sort of wise sources or people that I trust and respect, uh, talking about what are the best ways to actually implement things that you want. Um, but in some sense, I really firmly believe that sort of that moment of ego um, is very important in personal development. Yeah. I just want to reestablish the correct order of the universe here and say that the only person who's ever called Kevin petulant is Kevin. <laughs> So he's a so. beacon of generosity, and I say probably you should follow his lead on this. <laughs> a little bit of mischief is always probably good, and Kevin did just the right thing. He's just my old, <laughs> he's my old roommate. He's just got my back here. Yeah. So. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. So. turn this on. You're There's on. no green light. Okay. All right. Great. Hi, I'm Abigail DeHart, and I'm a senior here at Grand Valley, majoring in philosophy and classics, and I will be graduating in the spring, which is exciting. So we've just heard um, two really great talks, one about leading in the community setting and the other about leading in institutional settings. And what I want to talk about today is leading yourself. So. I want to ask the question, uh, what do we value? And how do we lead ourselves into what we value, especially when we have maybe more than one thing we value and it comes into conflict? So this is a perennial question. Philosophers, economists, psychologists, they've all tried to give us a sense of what it is that we value and, and given us theories as to how we can figure that out. So maybe it's a rational choice. Maybe it's choosing the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So we have lots of theories over thousands of years and the funny thing is human behavior still remains a very tricky thing. I don't know if you've noticed that but we might think we want to do something and then something comes up and we don't necessarily do it. Maybe you had full intention to come to the leader lens today and you couldn't really get out of bed. I'm mainly talking to those on the camera who are watching this later. Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming by the way. We appreciate it. But <laughs> You know, I think, as I, as I thought through this question, I think there's two ways, I would say, two methods to approach this question of what it is that we value. Um, on the one hand, you can use introspection. 
So watching and observing yourself in different kinds of situations. So um, maybe one easy example of this is you value healthy living and eating healthy, um, but the funny thing is when you're tired at night, you don't seem to eat the most healthy food. So you just start noticing these things about yourself. Oh, interesting, I thought I valued that. Um, maybe a more uh, nuanced example is you value putting people first and listening to them, and then you find yourself really stressed with exams and you start doing that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, interesting thing. So it's not to say you don't value that anymore. Maybe you have two different values. Maybe you have an exam coming up. And so while you really do uh, want to listen to this person, you also are about to fail an exam and you don't really want to hear more about their dog. So, I mean, these, these are the conflicts we come into um, every day. And it's just interesting to start observing yourself. Who am I in different situations when I have different kinds of moods and feelings? So another way to approach this values question, I think, is what I and the philosophers call from the armchair. So sitting back in a chair and thinking through, who am I when nobody's around? What is it that I value when nobody's watching me? I had the unique opportunity last year to put these two kinds of questions, these ways of approaching this question together. When I packed up my life into two bags, said bye to family and friends, and moved halfway across the world, all the way across the world, to India for almost an entire year. So there I was, and I really got to ask this question, who am I when nobody's around? And I got to observe myself in this actual situation. Where I uh, was in India, there's still not great cell phone service, the internet connection's not so great, and when I first got there, I really didn't know anybody. Um, I'd often take uh, some weekend solo trips, so when I go off into these places, I really would be the only one I know for miles. Very interesting time um, to ask myself these questions. So I was there for a more typical study abroad trip, but uh, I got to do a lot of cool things on the side. So um, I took language classes. I got to study with a sitar master, so I learned the sitar. And I also got to do, um, I know it's funny to picture, but I got to do a research project throughout the year. So this is one of my favorite uh, things that I did. And it was a very involved project. I got to work with um, a project manager. And I got my question was about schools and education systems in an international setting. So I got the opportunity to go into schools, to collect qualitative uh, research data, talk to parents, um, and hold focus groups. And it really started to allow me to ask and answer my own questions. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I want to talk about the utter irony of my year in India, which is that I have never been, at the same time, more noticeable and more anonymous. So if you start thinking about this, I go off into a country of 1.2 billion people. Um, you can be completely anon anonymous. But and there are other uh, fellows in the Leadership Academy that went to India in the summer. They'll know this. You walk out on the street. And so here I am, blonde hair, blue eyed, five, six something, and everyone notices you. So I mean, I, I felt anonymous in some sense. Nobody knew me, but I mean, there wasn't anywhere I'd go where people weren't watching and scrutinizing. And you know, I was a representation of America to a lot of these people. So you're under constant watch. At the same time, nobody knows you. And I think this is the important part. Nobody knows what you're capable of. So if you've, if you've noticed, you don't walk into new situations, like when you came to college, you don't walk in with a resume plastered to your forehead. So nobody knows what it is you can do, what you're capable of, if you're a leader. That's all stuff that you have to, in order to show that, you have to be the kind of person you were in other contexts. So I could very easily choose to make India kind of a year of retreat and rest if I wanted to could spend all day inside reading. Nobody would really know. I could spend all day walking around, wandering in and out of temples, engaging with the community. Again, nobody would really know. Nobody was monitoring me. Nobody was checking. I didn't have my mentors. So it really was a year where I had a wide open opportunity to do either one. So it was exhilarating and terrifying at the exact same time. And here lies what I want to talk about. I think in India, um, I had this unique opportunity to hide my leadership abilities, again, if I wanted to. So for those of you who are Harry Potter fans out there, I had an invisibility cloak 
for all my leadership potential. Um, I could hide it, or if you're more philosophically inclined, it was almost like a ring of gaijis. I could put it on and disappear, and nobody would know what I was capable of. So I, these were choices, these were options. I think this concept of leading yourself, of knowing what it is that you value, is really kind of another way of thinking through human motivation. So as we're leaders, we have these certain kinds of skill sets. We have things that we've chosen to live by. I've chosen these values, and these are what I pursue. This is what I, I aim myself at. These are the choices that I make. And we can think we know this about ourselves. So I thought I knew this about myself pretty clearly. I know what I value, um, what it is that I value kind of in a basic sense is I love helping people. And specifically, I love helping people by bringing them together, by making connections other people can't make, whether that be ideas, and for the purpose of basically empowering people. So I think this can have um, a variety of different outlets. Maybe uh, I was really involved in tutoring, maybe education, maybe some kind of public policy someday. But I knew that's what I valued. So I kind of figured out what this looked like at Grand Valley when I was here. Um, I, was, I felt like a leader in my classes. I had the Houndstein Center. Um, I've been part of it for three years. And so I really started to feel like I was really something, right? I was like, yeah, I have this figured out. I know what it is I'm pursuing. I'm running at it. Um, nothing can stop me. And then I went to India. And <laughs> in India, like I said, a lot of this could go away if I wanted it to because there really wasn't anybody checking. It was up to me, and it was up to my ability to lead myself and to really ask myself, what is it that I value when nobody's looking, when nobody can offer you a letter of recommendation, when nobody can make connections for you that you're going to want to use in the future? It's you. So I, I want to talk about two specific uh, examples of where I felt this tension, just to give a little illustration. Um, two ways that I felt, almost a literal voice in my head that told me, well, you could just not. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I felt I, this, this voice <laughs> that kept, kept talking to me. Um, but really, there was these moments where you really had attention. You could, like I said, you could spend a day inside reading or doing something for yourself. You could just not. So the first example I want to talk about is um, through personal learning. And I also had a very unique opportunity, it's never happened before, to take classes uh, that didn't transfer back as a grade. So it was credit, no credit. Um, very interesting time because really for the first time, I, it didn't matter as long as I passed what grade I got. So I like to think of myself as a very motivated lifelong learner that would be really incentivized to learn anyway. But when you put yourself in a context where you don't have to get an A in the class, it's really interesting to see what you do. I don't know if you've ever had that opportunity. <laughs> but you started to see, oh, what is it that I value? Are there certain subjects I really could just do without, or I don't find the motivation to learn or do the readings? So some classes, it was really easy to motivate myself to learn. And I felt a lot of um, autonomy, and I felt like I could lead myself into that better, more nuanced learning. But some other classes, not so much. And one in particular I'm going to talk about um, was really terrible. Uh, so it was two hours twice a week, and the professor didn't really know what he was doing in terms of leading a class. It was just what felt to us like babbling on and on and on about something. Um, maybe it was about the reading. We couldn't really tell. Uh, but the content wasn't bad. The readings weren't so bad. But in class, there was just no direction, and we didn't know what was going on. So about two weeks in, I decided that my time could be better spent reading in the back. So I did. <laughs> so for the rest of the semester, I decided I would sit in the corner and read my own book because I felt like I could uh, be a better learner that way, and I would use my time wisely and not bother with all of this that's going on in front of me, because um, attendance still mattered, unfortunately. <laughs> so why I saw this as a problem, and almost me putting on this ring or invisibility cloak to hide my leadership ability is I know what I can be in a classroom. And there were opportunities for me to be this. There were moments where professors, the professor would ask for student feedback or you could engage in dialogue about the reading. The, the space was pretty wide open for that. And I didn't take it. And I did start to see, you know, this is something, this is an opportunity where you could be a leader, you could bring ideas together, and you could engage in really good conversation. And I didn't do it. So the second thing I want to talk about, it's another area I felt 
this tension. A part of my research project, um, when I got there, I decided pretty early on, I didn't just want to be this uh, sociological researcher. I wanted to engage in the community. So I made a community engagement aspect as a pretty critical part of my project. So I decided that in order to study the educational system, I had to be a part of the educational system. So I decided to become a volunteer. So I worked in a public school and a private school. Um, at one, I tutored English. And at the other, I taught a music class. And um, I, the tension first was, in India, uh, those of you who have been, the time isn't really a big deal. Actually, I know a lot of uh, countries are like this. You could be five minutes late, 10 minutes late, no big deal. Um, you could not show. Again, not a big deal. So this was an option for me, but it's not an option I wanted to take. I did want to be there. I wanted to consistently show up. I wanted to be there for the kids. I wanted to establish a relationship. And I also wanted to, in this context, be seen as a leader. I wanted to get to know parents, to get to know teachers. And I didn't just want to be that person that showed up every now and again. So while it was difficult, it added on a whole lot of time that a lot of other people weren't um, taking the time to do. Uh, added a lot to my year. It's something I felt was a priority. It was something I valued. It was something that I would get a lot out of. So while the tension was there, it's something I felt like, um, even though at times I didn't want to, it's something I led myself to do. And I think a lot came out of this. Specifically, uh, just one instance, um, in tutoring the English classes, I would be reading these books where they would be learning English. And I found myself uh, explaining Mount Rushmore. Now, this might not seem weird to you, but I was in India. And these were uh, third graders. And I was explaining to them what Mount Rushmore was because it was in their book, in their English book. And it slowly started to occur to me, you know, they probably couldn't even tell me four presidents in their own country. Why should they be having to learn about presidents in our country? They have no context for it. They really don't have the incentive to learn these things. So while they're learning English, is there a way we could start to uh, teach English with something that they can understand, something they see in the world around them. Isn't that part of the learning process? That's kind of what Kevin was talking about, learning to lead yourself in that way. Oh, I'm interested in this. Tell me more. Those questions just weren't coming up, and that was a problem. So I mean, this is just one specific instance. Um, and it really got my, it uh, piqued my interest in international education and issues of equality, um, ways that we can start to think about, well, now we're in this globalizing, intense world and education is important. So how do we design curriculums that might be more uh, interesting naturally to kids? So that's something I don't think I could have gotten that in any other way. I don't think I could sit in America and read a book about it. I don't think I could have gotten it if I was just a college student in India studying abroad. So that's just one specific instance of a way I led myself and I saw the benefits of it. Now, I don't want to make it seem like I figured this out. I didn't. Um, there's still instances I find it really hard to lead myself back here. Uh, but what I think it did is I was able to ask that question, what do I value? I think it came to a firmer understanding of that question. I saw myself on my good days, on my bad days, and I really, got to, I really got a firmer understanding of some of the things I do value. So I'm not advocating for everyone to drop what you're doing and go to India for a year, though I think it would be a great idea if you want to. <laughs> but I realize that's not practical. But I do challenge you to look at your own life and spaces that are carved out where you can ask these questions. Um, so to take those, both of those methods, one, just observing yourself, and two, where are spaces you can ask these questions? What do I value? Maybe it's here at the Hounstein Center. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's at home. Maybe it's when you're on in your resting times, on vacations. We're about to be on a very long Christmas vacation. It's a great time. What are you when school's not there? Do you still read? Do you still answer your email? And do you still engage in the community? I mean, these are great ways to figure it out. So while I haven't figured it out, I don't think we can. any of us can ever figure it out. We can work to become. Uh, a lot more understanding of our own values and how to direct our lives in that direction. Thank you.
you have to sort of navigate the contradictions or the like conflicting values within yourself. Um, and you provided us an example of one where you swung one direction and one where you swung another. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could answer, so like what pushes you towards one particular option over another? Is it something, some sort of realization that you've had inside? Is it external factors? Is it something else that you're looking at? It's a good, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think in some sense, so in, the, in that first example where I swung one way, uh, I do think, looking back on it, I would have wanted to have that be an example where I swung the other way, to be honest. Um, it's, it's a place I saw I could have and should have done a little bit differently. But I do think, again, it, it comes with, again, asking those questions and knowing yourself. Because, I don't know, I mean, not in every case should you uh, be fully and absolutely there every single time. There's sometimes you have to realize, I'm taking on this new opportunity, and it's not really working out. Um, because we have limited time, a limited life, and a lot we can do. So I think what's important is uh, when you do agree to do something, do it with everything you've got, but know when it's not aligning with your values. Um, know when it's maybe not necessarily, it's, it's too hard. Sometimes, well, this comes up and every time I want to choose this. I think actually a great example of this is uh, Helmstein events, perhaps, because Gen I mean, sometimes they conflict with classes, sometimes they conflict with other things you have going on on campus. I mean, those are examples. I'm not saying one should be chosen over the other, but which one do you find yourself choosing um, in when classes conflict with events? Sometimes I choose events over classes, sometimes I choose classes over events, and I think I, it comes from knowing what it is that I value. There we go, what's the most important, well, let me preface the question. I also say to Rob once upon a time, a long time mm -hmm. ago, and for those of us who got together at one point, it was in a Fulbright program, uh, one of the most interesting comments I received again and again was that the Americans who were, happened to be in West Germany at that time, that if they could be themselves. They didn't have all the burdens of the expectations at home or in their community. And it, it was very liberating for them, uh, for us. And I guess my question is, when, when you, you, you're talking about liberation, you're, you're, these choices. Um, so when you come back here from that year abroad, who was it that you were there that you absolutely insist on hanging on to now? <laughs> And there's a the flip side of that question, which I will not ask. <laughs> <laughs> but I am curious how you would answer it. Sitting on top of mountains and meditating. That, <laughs> I can't do that here? <laughs> um, I didn't do that. Well, I kind of did. Um, <laughs> no, that's a great question. It's one I honestly uh, am still working through. Even uh, I've been back for uh, four or five months, still working through that. What have I uh, latched onto? And I mean, how do I look different from before I left? I think one way. Specifically, again, it comes with having listened to myself a little bit more. Is I uh, never used to be, uh, I guess, in, in same with Kevin's example. I would never really bring up conflict. Uh, I would always take the path of least resistance. In some sense, I didn't want to create controversy. I wanted everyone to get along. And I think in India, what I realized, um, coming in contact with so many different opinions and so many. Uh, really, really awful things that I saw that were not okay. In no context did I think they were okay. Um, realizing that there were some things I do believe I have latched onto as a value, and I will speak up for them. And that's not something I think I would have done as adamantly before I went to India. And I felt a lot of, again, freedom to figure that out and say, oh, I have a voice and I want to use it. Uh, maybe it swings a little too much to this side now. I think uh, I can learn to you know, be polite again in some context, <laughs> but I, no, I don't think it's bad. I'm interested, so because you had this sort of ring of gadgets moment, it sounded like, well, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about how um, in your efforts to think about when you could be a leader in India, the one thing you realized is that uh, it wouldn't necessarily be because anyone could write a letter of recommendation for you. And I think that that's a struggle that a lot of a lot of us have uh, as undergraduates is we wonder if our leadership or our drive toward leadership is in some sense a drive toward upward social mobility in some sense. Um, and it sounded like in India you realized that that wasn't a necessarily a factor there. Uh, 
I'm wondering, what did you find was the actual factor for your um, decision to try to be a leader? Why is it that initially you did feel like, uh, in the first instance, um, you were in some sense remiss in your duties? Is it because of some sense of social responsibility or some sense of just some kind of inner urge? What would you describe mm -hmm. it as? Um, I think what immediately comes to mind in that uh, specifically in this kind of context where I'm for the first time given this freedom away from social duty that I felt before I think what you start to find is yeah again there's nobody holding you up or expecting these things of you for the first time uh, nobody in 10 years is gonna remember and reference this thing that you did or didn't do what I found that I started to realize and these parts of leadership that were that I actually did have as a value is I felt that Again, it goes with this uh, big picture, kind of I see things that other people don't see. I started to see and understand how maybe organizations or things I was a part of could be uh, run better, and people were really receptive to that. So I think it was uh, kind of incredible to see, oh, uh, when I see something, notice it and take the initiative to suggest changes, and I'm willing to work with you to make those changes. Uh, people were really, again, receptive to that, and that was a, something that was valued. Um, and valued in any context that I was in, uh, which is pretty great to find out. So this is something it does, it's a harder choice. It's easy to just sit there and let things go and say, well, <laughs> I get to leave in you know, uh, seven months. I mean, that would be an easy choice, but it's not one that I wanted to make at the end. Uh, maybe at first, it, it seemed attractive. It's like, for once I can hide. I don't have to be so much of a leader. I can sit back a little bit and relax and drink tea, but not for long, I found. And I, I bet that's true of a lot of you. If you're in a new context, we are going to move probably uh, a lot in our lives. And we're going to be in these new contexts. And it probably won't take you long to show up, is what I would guess. It was at the same time, I, I loved it and I hated it. And it was funny to just notice the times where I loved it and when I hated it. Um, I think the hard part is in the moments where you just want to feel comfortable again, um, where it, things are just really hard. You want somebody to talk to you in English for a, like, just speak as quickly as you can about all the things you're processing. <laughs> and you can't really do that. Um, I couldn't really do that in India so much. Uh, but. I think the, uh, the flip side of that is it was really, really awesome for me to not have that because I think I'm, I'm really big into I love finding out what other people think and what other people's lives are like. And I think I realized there's a lot of people that have these situations where they don't necessarily have the strong support systems I've had. And it was really interesting to watch. So I mean, Christmas, uh, Christmas, I, I, I did stay with a, uh, a host family. So they kind of became my family. But on Christmas, it was really weird. I tried Skyping home, and the connection wasn't great. So I was like, oh, hi. <laughs> Open a present for me. I mean, so those are the moments where it was difficult. At the same time, it was an incredible experience just to um, find out what that's like. Who am I, again, when nobody's around, when my support system's not there? That's, oh, that's a very good question. I think especially because uh, what I found, and I would I mentioned this earlier, I would intentionally take weekend trips alone because there were some other Americans in the program. We didn't have too much interaction, but we did have that there. But I would take weekend trips alone intentionally because I, I like to call it this American filter. When you're with other people that are Americans, you walk around and you can speak in English, you can process in English, and it does put a filter on everywhere you go because you have that option. Whereas when you're walking around alone, I do think you notice more, uh, more affects you, and you're, again, you, I, mean, I would have to speak and use the Hindi I've been learning and uh, bargain with people and get from point A to point B. Uh, so I think in that context, it made me more, more independent and realized some of these, these questions I couldn't have asked if people were around me.
you do have a, an opportunity to influence and make change, but you're also kind of constrained. And people say, well, you're just a student, you don't know about it. And I know you and I have talked a little bit about how in India that kind of wasn't there because what they see you as instead is uh, an American, and there's a certain value placed on that. So what kind of, I guess especially with your volunteer work and going to the schools, what kind of like ethical dilemma does that present, I guess, to you when suddenly you have all this authority or influence and people will take what you say or want to impress you or... Um... No, I think that's an excellent point and it was worded very well because I think, so I'll answer it in my context, but I do think it extends on to any time you find yourself with a title or in a position that you weren't in before because you can start to have this imposter syndrome of I'm actually not this title that I now have, but everyone's gonna defer to me. And that's crazy because I know myself and I know I shouldn't have it. But I think in India, so part, so part of that is I was, I was an American and not just a student and I, my opinion was very valued. And so I think what you can run the risk of is pretending to know more and be more than you are easy to let it go to your head. I cannot tell you, I'm serious, how many interviews on TV I had because I was the American around and, oh man, what do you think? And I, I just feel, well, let me tell you about <laughs> these little thoughts in my head. But I mean, it's just, a, you can start to play that part. You can let it get to your head. But I think what's important is to, to be honest and say, well, I actually do have limitations and, and especially to admit when you don't know. And it's very easy to fake that. Uh, very easy and it's it's I don't think maybe some cases it's okay but in a lot of cases it can cause it can cause big problems what about when um, and I know we've talked about this a lot but I feel like it'd be interesting to share maybe a little like when because of this perceived authority um, people put on a mask for you and it makes it hard mm -hmm. to diagnose a problem or, or to even just grasp the truth of a situation yeah that's a great thing to bring up too because I felt this in the schools I would go into. So many times I wished I could have just been invisible and walked into the schools because the minute I'd walk in, so especially for English tutoring, I would come in and there was an English class um, and somebody would be teaching it who was native, uh, was a native Hindi speaker but they knew English. But the minute I'd walk in it would just be deferred to pronunciation to me, everything to me. Which is, I mean it's okay, I was an expert in English in that context. But I think what was so difficult about that is other contexts where, uh, where I might not know, but it's automatic. It's your opinion. And again, I would say it has to do with things that can start going to your head in ways that, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I, I never did work out how to not be there but still be there. But I do, I would say showing up consistently maybe helped. Um, and maybe just being a person. So maybe, I don't, I don't know, there's maybe nonverbals that can help with that too, is um, making sure that maybe there's, this, there's these few important people you should talk to, but maybe not, uh, maybe making it a point to talk to the people in the room that don't have the gold-plated name tag, and that's in many contexts. Just being a person and not letting, again, not letting those things go to your head. Um, you know, um, I, I'm too kind of trying to kind of phrase my presentation, or my, my question about your presentation eloquently. Um, so I guess, you know, as a driven and ambitious person, when you go to India and all of these kind of social obligations that surrounded you at home are gone, and it's just about who you, you know, really are and what you value, um, you know, as a driven, ambitious person who's trying to, uh, you know, make a difference, I, I imagine that you probably had kind of tremendous battles with impatience with yourself mm -hmm. and with the people around you at times. And this is um, something that I was speaking about with another fellow. Um, you know, how, how did you address that? And has that affected the way that you relate to yourself and to other people now that you're back in the US? Mm -hmm. I think this is, again, <laughs> really great because I, I think you've somehow identified something I felt in India. I, I didn't articulate it in this, but it was this impatience. In some sense, I knew being in India was probably one of the most important choices I had made in my own development. 
But again, it felt in some ways like a pause. So I mentioned before, I felt like I had figured it out in Grand Rapids. I was in the Leadership Academy. I was well, doing well in my classes. And I, had, pretty, I felt like I had it all figured out. And I was running forward straight to whatever was next. And going to India, while I knew it was really important, it felt like a pause button in some sense. And it was really hard to convince myself that uh, for example, learning has many different faces and it doesn't have to be how I've expected it. And I think the kind of learning I did in India, I can't even, I mean, it wasn't a formalized thing. It was very much, again, it was this personal learning. Um, and I think that and the impatience was absolutely there. It's, I want to do these things now. I want to accomplish A, B, C, and D. And India is constantly elusive to that. They don't say, oh, yes, your plan. Let's do it in five minutes. No, these things take a long time. India, in particular, uh, to get something done takes a lot of different kinds of people. And it just it takes a lot of uh, legwork to get something done. So I think um, also with that, learning that other people have a lot of wisdom. Um, so I'm impatient, and I think I have the best way of doing things, and then realizing, wait a minute, uh, that was a really good point. In fact, uh, maybe taking a second, taking a step back, and thinking about the way you think about this and would approach this could make a better uh, event or initiative, or it could really, our, our perspectives together would be best. So I think in terms of patience, that's what I learned, which was hard for me. <laughs>